Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Today's episode is brought to you by the financial support of our listeners, and I especially want to thank Robert for sending along a donation. It is truly appreciated, and we'll send him access to our premium site, as we do with all donations of $7 or more. Uh, well, we're going to play a somewhat different episode of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is not the beginning of the Bob Bailey run. Bob Bailey was not the only actor considered for bringing Johnny Dollar back to the air. It was canceled at the end of the 1953-54 radio season. CBS really did want to have a adult 15-minute daily uh, serial mystery. And they tried a couple of programs by the time that they did uh, air yours truly, Johnny Dollar. In summer of uh, 1954, they tried uh, taking Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons, which began in 1937 as a 15-minute-a-day serial and trying to restore it to that format. Uh, that didn't last long. Uh, and later on that year, they also tried it, it with Mr. and Mrs. North. In addition, they recorded a Jack Moyles audition to bring Rocky Jordan back as a 15-minute-a-day program. Uh, none of these uh, efforts uh, were... Uh, uh, were successful, uh, but they didn't keep, tr they didn't stop trying. Uh, and so, in addition to considering Bob Bailey, they also considered Gerald Moore. Uh, radio fans will best remember Gerald Moore in his role as Philip Marlowe, which critics and fans alike absolutely love from 1948 to 50, and then returned for a summer replacement run in, uh, 1951. Moore had uh, turned to television. He'd taken a lead role on the series for an entry, but that had ended at the uh, conclusion of the 1954-55 season. His work would slow down a little bit, and I guess that left open the possibility of doing a radio program. Today's episode is called The Trans-Pacific Matter, and it's based on an Edmund O'Brien script uh, that was also done by John Lunn, uh, and Back in 1952, CBS had also considered doing a five-part serial. What we're going to get is acting for part one and part five of the series. So you're going to miss a little bit of the plot, but nothing's being cut out. It just wasn't uh, recorded. So here now, in what might have been Gerald Moore as yours truly Johnny Dollar in The Trans-Pacific Matter. From Hollywood, it's time now for Gerald Moore as... Johnny Dollar. Al Harper at Corinthian, Johnny. Hi, Al. I've got a case here you won't like, but the commission will be good if we beat it. How big is the policy? $200,000. Oh. Yeah, I'm afraid to tell you the rest. Why? It's in Hong Kong. Well, he haven't scared me yet. Johnny, the policyholders are people we've had trouble with before. I'm still not scared. No? Huh? You remember the Trans-Pacific Import-Export Office? Yeah. I sent flowers to the widow. Yeah. You still want to crack at it? No, but I will. Good. Al. Yeah. Now I'm scared. Tonight and every weekday night, Gerald Moore in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Home Office, Corinthian Liability and Risk, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Trans-Pacific matter. 
Item one, plane fare to Hong Kong. Bobbing head of my rickshaw boy, I found Hong Kong to be a city without simplicity, overburdened with the tragic complexities of war. To fill the smallest want is a difficult and expensive task. There's a shortage of everything food, water, health, places to live. Both the island itself and the city of Kowloon over on the mainland were loaded with refugees from the interior, many of them lining the streets wailing for arms as we made our way to the offices of the American consul. Yes, it is true. Life is very difficult here. Now, where are they all going, Miss... Uh... Where is there for them to go? What do they do? How do they stay alive? Many of them don't. So many of them. It is not like this in Indoor America? No. Has it ever been? Well, it was a civil war once. Books say that at times it was pretty bad. But not like this. Oh, never. Louisa. Yes, Mr. Grover. So would you ask Mr. Dollar to step in, please? Yes, sir. I got it, thanks. Well, Hartford, Connecticut, huh? Come in, Mr. Dollar. How are you, Mr. Grover? Sit down, sit down. Thanks. That's right. Insurance investigation, huh? Yeah. Well, now, what's your errand and what can the consulate do for you? Well, I'm here to investigate a claim filed by Trans-Pacific Import-Export Company. Oh, yes, yes, of course. Well, Will Meadows' firm was destroyed by fire last month. hundred percent. Or rather, two hundred thousand dollars worth to my company... You know this William Meadows, Mr. Grover? Oh, I've met him at the American Club now and then. That's about all. Uh, insurance investigators are hired when... When the company uh... isn't satisfied with something about the claim. On this one, the fire was blamed on vandalism. Well, vandalism's become quite a popular pastime, across in Kowloon especially. Do you suspect some sort of fraud? Frankly, we do. Trans-Pacific once had a branch in Shanghai... When the war closed in on them, their warehouse was burnt to the ground, just like this one here. Oh, I see. It occurred to some of the people in my home office that Trans-Pacific did much better by collecting on the insurance than if they'd gone through the expense of liquidating. Ah. Uh, I suppose coincidence won't quite do it, will it? Uh-uh. Uh, mm-hmm. Well, now, how can I help you? Well, I'd appreciate some phone calls or letters that would give me support from the fire department and the police. Mm. Yes, of course you would. <laughs> I don't suppose my problem seems very important out here. I was thinking that very thing. You know, it's always the case, Mr. Dollar. On the fringe of war, very few individual problems seem really important. Nor the individuals themselves. I trust you'll keep that in mind. I'll try to. Uh, Getting help, even time, from the police or fire brigade is one of those individual problems. But I'll do what I can for you. Anything will help, Mr. Grover. I won't take any more of your time. Oh, um, be sure to leave your number with my girl. I'll let you know about the official assistance. Well, I came right here from the airport. I don't have a number yet. Oh. For uh, no hotel? No. Pretty tough? As a matter of fact, almost impossible. The accidental places are always filled. Uh, I tell you, speak with my receptionist, Miss uh, Vedras. Is that her name? Vedras? Uh, yes. Her father's half Portuguese, owns a small hotel. He might have accommodations. Good. I'll ask her. Thanks again. Oh, uh, Mr. Dollar... Just a matter of interest. Yeah? The case of Trans-Pacific Import in Shanghai. You say your company was forced to meet the claim there? That's right. Was it uh, investigated? The investigator they sent over was killed before he could build a case. Miss Vedras arranged for accommodations at her father's place on a dingy street called Sing Wang. A hill of steps along the waterfront overshadowed by the plush European mansions on the top of Victoria Peak. I had a room that looked out on an alley. Iron bed, a chair, a pitcher of water on a bamboo table. I was the only non-Oriental in the building. And I seemed to be the only one to notice it. Yeah, the first night I suffered from a combination of claustrophobia and loneliness. Feelings that made me glad to find out who it was that knocked at my door. Well, hello. Mr. Grover asked me to tell you he has contacted a man named Harrison. He's at the fire control office. Oh? 
Mr. Grover also asked me to tell you that Mr. Harrison will see you tomorrow morning. Good. Uh, won't you come in? Come on in. Thank you. Are you comfortable? <laughs> Thanks to you, this is fine. I, uh, I don't have much to offer you. Cigarette, scotch, Miss Vedras? I'm very curious. About what? Why you are here? Oh. Well, it's business, if that's what you mean. But it's better kept confidential. Is there danger in this business? Why do you ask that? Because you were followed and you are being watched. How do you know? Oh, I know seeing Wall Street. I have seen this man before, but not here. Where is he? Perhaps you can see him from the window. You see that shop on the other side where the boxes are piled near the door? Yeah. Say you've seen him, huh? Where? I cannot remember that. I have just seen him. Mm-hmm. Well, there's no need to worry. There won't be any trouble. You seem very sure of that. <laughs> I have the advantage. He doesn't know I know he's there. Thanks for telling me about him. Perhaps you know who he is. No. I didn't think anybody knew I was in town. You, you would just let it go on, this watching? No, there's not much choice. Let's talk about something else, huh? Uh, what's that song? Hmm? Oh, it's a love song. About two lonely people who meet near a river. Oh? In America, the songs are a little different. Yes, I know. I like them. Do you know many Americans? Oh, yes. At the consulate office, I see them all the time. I want to marry one. I'd say he was a very lucky American. Oh, no, no, you don't understand. I don't mean there is only one. I want to marry an American who will take me away from China. There is no other way. You hate it that much? There's nothing else to do but hate it. There is no good here. Always trouble. Mm -hmm. The Chinese are a patient people, but I am not all Chinese. And I cannot make myself be patient any longer. I want to go to America where people thrive on impatience. Mm -hmm. You know, I think from what I have seen that Americans are the most impatient people in all the world. Yeah, that's right. They say we kill ourselves that way, heart and stomach. Oh, no, you live longer and, and better. What about your Portuguese people? They are gone. You... You think I'm wrong to be this way? No. I didn't say that. I hope you find your American, Miss Vedras. You... You want me to go now? I think you better. I'll see you tomorrow. Yes. Good night. Three things interfered with sleep that night. The pleading in the eyes of the girl. The smells and sounds that drifted into my room from the restless, crowded city. And the watcher who was still at his station across the street when I turned out my light. Yeah, the toughest part of this case was that failure in Shanghai where the agent had been killed. It was a pretty sobering memory. And for that reason, every face on Sing Wong Street was a suspicious one. Every group of Hong Kong Chinese were potential assassins. With my watcher across the street, the first to be reckoned with. Well, gun in hand, eyes on the street. I fell asleep that night watching him. In the morning, there was a different man in his place. I was followed to the office of Harrison, chief of the fire brigade, who had developed couldn't see me after all. So with time on my hands, I decided to talk to William Meadows, head of Trans-Pacific, the firm I'd come to investigate. Oh, yes, mister? Mr. Meadows at home? Oh, yes, sir. Uh, you give name, please? Who is it, Lim? Uh, American gentleman. My name is Dollar, Mr. Meadows. I'm from Corinthian Liability, Hartford office. Wait a you coming, please? What'd you say your name was? Dollar. What's the matter with that company anyway? Didn't the adjuster send in his report? What are you doing here? Now, wait a minute, Mr. Meadows. This doesn't have to be unpleasant. They sit back there in Hartford with nothing to worry about but Sunday's golf game. They don't know a thing about the conditions we're working under. Well, they do know your fire here pretty much follows the pattern of the one in Shanghai. Of same course it does. The conditions are the same. Including the, quote, starving refugees, unquote, who killed and robbed the investigator? Careless people are dying here every day. It can happen pretty easy. 
Now say what you have to say and get out of here. Now, it's very little, Mr. Meadows. I came here mainly to get my reaction to you. I have. You jumped to the conclusion you were under suspicion before I got through that door. You're on the defensive, so you got to have a reason to be. Sure, I'm out, Lynn. You come now, Mr. Dunn. Now, wait a minute. More important, you're having me followed. you got to be afraid of me. Oh, uh, please, hold Mr. Hold on, Dollar. hold on. I'm not afraid of you, Dollar. Or what you might find, or what you might try to do. My warehouse burnt down here, and that dandy little company of yours is going to pay the claim. True, I don't like your snooping around. I don't like you coming here like this, and you know it. No man would. And that's the biggest parcel of information you'll get from me. And I'll go elsewhere. Good idea. Have your dreams, Dollar. But have them someplace else. Go snoop through the ashes. Mainly, just get out of here. No, Mr. Dollar. I Please, can uh... find the door. <laughs> Two things came out of that conversation with William Meadows. First, a reasonable platform to build a strong suspicion on. Second, what Meadows was really saying was, this is my town and I run things and anybody who gets in my way can get hurt. A real nice situation. I'd been threatened and I was being followed. Expense account item two. Seven dollars for a bottle of scotch. I rickshawed back to my hotel, locked myself in, and took up my vigil by the window. Yeah, same man watching from across the street. Same kind of night. In a city where life was supposedly so cheap, mine began to grow expensive. Now, here is our star, Gerald Moore, to tell you about tomorrow's episode. Thanks. Tomorrow night, a complicated lesson in how to get shot at by your best friend and like it. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced in Hollywood. Written by E. Jack Newman and Gil Dowd, the entire production is under the direction of Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for another exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. George Walsh speaking. This is the CBS Radio Network. From Hollywood, it's time now for Gerald Moore as... Johnny Dollar. Superintendent Clyde here. You telephone? Yeah, I got a bird in my room who's ready to sing. Sing? Are you holding someone prisoner? I just scalped a two-bit thug that William Meadows had on me. The next one on my list is Meadows himself. I warn you, Dollar, any illegal action will be answered for here at headquarters. Does that work all the way around? What? Send out a wagon and pick this baby up. He was carrying a knife and a gun when I bopped him. He tried to kill me. All right, Mr. Dollar. I'll come at once. Tonight and every weeknight, Gerald Moore in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Fifth day in Hong Kong. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Home Office, Corinthian Liability and Risk, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an account of additional expenses during my investigation of the Trans-Pacific Arson case. And it is arson, I'm sure of it. Item 14. Seven dollars, wreckage, wreckage of bamboo curtains in my hotel room during scuffle with Thug who had murder in his eye. A tough-looking oriental in a suit that was too big in the shoulders. Not so tough without his killing equipment. Dollar. Dollar. Not so fast, buddy. We got business. Okay, who sent you? 
Meadows? Yes. Yes, Meadow. That's better. Now let's have the rest of it, including burning down a warehouse to collect... Just a moment, Mr. Dollar. Just one moment. What's going on here? I'm trying to find out, Mr. Clyde. Well, that's enough. Wilson, take Mr. Dollar's gun. Not mine. His. I took it from him. Nevertheless. All right, here. Well, now. This is the man you apprehended? Ken Lou? You know him? I've seen him. Now, you know his name, and I know he works for Meadows, and he's been following me and tried to kill me. That ought to be enough for you to go to work on. One thing at a time, Mr. Dollar. Are you sure this man is in the employ of William Meadows? He just told me. Under uh, duress? Sure, I'd arrest him. I'd arrest anybody with that kind of equipment, wouldn't you? Now, calm down, old boy. A warehouse is burned to the ground. A girl is killed. There's an attempted murder, and you say calm down. I repeat it, calm down. All right, men, you take him to headquarters. We'll see what he has to say about all this. Why don't we see right here? And then, if he can throw any light on the matter, we'll proceed further. Oh, I don't get you... The department and I have stood for all of the badgering we will from you, Mr. Dollar. Your case of arson against William Meadows consists of nothing but notarized statements from people who could have said almost anything. Their accusations with regard to the murder of that poor girl do bear consideration. But they are also very inconclusive. And you haven't done anything about it either. Uh, we do things our way, Mr. Dollar, in spite of your insurance company. Well, what about him, that, that Pen Lou? Well, he'll be questioned most thoroughly. Then we shall proceed. Or drop the whole matter. Really? Well, I'm proceeding right now. Yes, I heard you on the phone. You said you were going to get Meadows. I'm going to get a confession from him. Mr. Dollar, I checked on you as an investigator quite thoroughly. Thank you. You have a reputation in your United States. An enviable one. I can't disregard that. But I cannot disregard either the fact that this case is very complex and must be investigated cautiously. Now, we'll question this man in our way and for our reasons. And I'll let you know the results. Well, what about my case? That will come out eventually. I didn't have to call you, but I did, because I thought at least you'd be convinced that now's the time to get Meadows and help me. I can see I was wrong. Wait one moment. Where are you going? Out. Mr. Dollar, I have no reason to arrest you right now, but I will, if you do anything out of line. I will be contacting you, and I suggest that you wait here. I didn't wait. Expense account item 15. $48 American for rental on 1935 Packard. I got tired of rickshaws. I had a hard time driving through the Hong Kong streets. Anybody would. It was still jammed with humanity. Humanity on the verge of panic. Humanity living on the edge of a war. And I'll say this for the old Packard. The horn worked beautifully. And hardly anybody paid any attention to it. It took me a solid hour to get to the south part of town where Meadows lived. Meadows! Meadows, open up! Somebody open up or I'll shoot the lock off. Who, who is it? Open this door. Hurry it up. Wait. Oh. oh, hello, Mr. Dollar. Where's Meadows? Mr. Meadows, he not here. You you come back. No. Uh, Prince, Prince, you wait, wait. Mr. Meadows is not here, I tell you. Close the door. But uh, Mr. Meadows, he not here. Meadows! Meadows! He? Not here. You come back. Where is he? He, he say come back next week. You, you come back next week. He see you then. Now you go. Please. If you know where he is, tell me. You come back next week. Now listen, I don't want to hurt you. Do you understand? No, 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 not hurt. But I will hurt plenty if I don't find out where he is. It's important. Now tell me. Where is he? He say not to tell anybody. Tell me. Uh, oh, oh, I... He, he go Kowloon. Kowloon, huh? Yes. You, you'll find him there. And you go with me. And if he's not there, then I hurt. Oh. I'll try again. Where is he? Oh, I, I tell you. R Repulse Bay. What'd you say? Repulse Bay. Repulse Bay. That's on the other side of the island where the big hotel is? Yes, sir. Y yes, he does. Can I call him on the telephone? Y yes, 
Yes, you, you call. Is he at the hotel? He got a cottage, number seven, the last one. Where's the telephone? Priest, you, you not tell how you learned he there, please. Where's the telephone? Here. Telephone. Call the number, I'll talk. Now go ahead. Mr. Meadow, cottage, please. One moment. Okay, give it to me. Hello? 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 Oh, you, you see? I tell truth, he there. Yeah, you did fine. You, you, you go see? Yeah. You, no, 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 no tell. No tell. But it won't make any difference now. Not understand, Mr. Dollar. You will. old package got me there in 40 minutes. I was already in front of the cottage seven when the police cars slid to a quiet stop. Superintendent Clyde spotted me. Just a moment, Dollar. We came here not because of what you said, but to see to it that nothing happens that might better be prevented. Thank you. You terrified that houseboy of Meadows. He called us and said that you'd been there. You're a hot-headed, impetuous... No, this time you happen to be right. About Pen Lu. Huh? Pen Lu admitted that he'd been hired by Meadows to kill you. We took time to check his gun. Although he didn't admit that part, it's the same gun that killed Louisa Vedras. Louisa. But it isn't clear. Why would Meadows have her killed? Don't you see? They killed her thinking it was me. What? Well, Louisa and I got to know each other pretty well during the first days I was here. There's been a bad job for the nerves. What with the murder of the man who investigated Meadows in Shanghai and... Now, she got me a room at her father's hotel. She was there when I came back after a pretty bad day. I knew somebody was following me, and I guess I needed somebody to be with. So she stayed a while. She was there the next night waiting for me in the room. And she was waiting for me to come back the, the night she was killed. Oh, well, that answers me. Now, this is for my own information. I'm not police work. Are you here to get Meadows for your company or because of Louisa? She was a lovely girl. All right. He's a difficult man. Do what you can. What? Your turn, Dollar. You waited a long time for it. Make your play. Try to clear up what you have to for the insurance company. It'll be difficult after we've arrested him. Good luck. Thanks. Who is it? Dollar! Who? Dollar! You know I'm still alive, Meadows. You know that girl was shot at the hotel room instead of me. Are you crazy? I stopped the man you had following me. His statement will put you in plenty of hot water. Now, are you coming down or shall I come in? Come on in. We'll talk about it. All right, I'm coming in. Okay. Meadows! Come on down. Meadows! <laughs> I, I told you. You should have known you wouldn't take me. Oh, I hit you, didn't I? Just the arm. You'll be all right. Should have been your stomach. You're cashing in, Meadows. How about it? A statement. No. Tell it, Meadows, how you fired the warehouse and about the girl who can't hurt you now. Uh, I'll tell nothing. Tell me, are you all right? Meadows. You should have... should have got you. All right, darling. Better have that arm taken care of. <laughs> Expense account item 16. Forty-three dollars even. Medical fees and hospital charges. I don't suppose it could be called hewing to the niceties of jurisprudence since Meadows was dead. And he refused before dying to speak or write his confession, but... There were two police carloads of witnesses who took the fact that he had opened fire as an acceptable admission of guilt. Same thing cleared me legally on the grounds of self-defense. I had hoped it would clear my mind, but it hasn't. Louisa Vedras is still there. 
I guess she always will be. Item 17, same as item 1. Plane fare back to the United States. Expense account total, $4,515 in the fifth day. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here is our star, Gerald Moore, to tell you about next week's story. Thanks. Monday night, the story of a ship, the Molly K. Destination, Davy Jones' locker. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Truly, Johnny Dollar is produced in Hollywood. Written by E. Jack Newman and Gil Dowd, the entire production is under the direction of Jack Johnstone. Heard in the cast were Lillian Bayef, Will Wright, Tony Barrett, Harry Bartell, and Ben Wright. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. George Walsh speaking. This is the CBS Radio Network. Welcome back. Well, an interesting performance by Moore. I thought that the first part was clearly the better, uh, perf- uh, better performance. Kind of the, a calmer, more, um, uh, tender performance, uh, when dealing, um, when dealing with the, uh, uh, woman and meeting her. Uh, it almost seemed like that when we got to the second half of the program, when he was getting tougher, it was almost just too intense. And, you know, as we see, we'll hear when we listen to Bob Bailey in the role, uh, this, it really wasn't quite what they were going for. Um, but, uh, an interesting performance. He went on to have a lot of great, uh, character roles and, uh, performances. Uh, in television and in voice acting. Uh, but uh, yours truly, Johnny Dollar, that job would fall to someone else. Uh, and we'll tell you a little bit about uh, the Bob Bailey years as we begin to listen to them uh, next uh, week. So join us next Friday. You've asked for it for years. Now we're going to play it for you. Bob Bailey takes over as yours truly, Johnny Dollar, excuse me, on Monday. We will bring you that. So join us next Monday for uh, part one and part two of our first Johnny Dollar uh, adventure with Bob Bailey. And uh, then uh, join us on Wednesday and Friday as well. Uh, next Friday, we will also have a one-shot program, because um, we're going to feature some 15-minute programs on Friday, in addition to yours truly, Johnny Dollar. So in addition to yours truly, Johnny Dollar, we'll have a program for you called uh, Police Woman. So, a lot of fun ahead next week. Tomorrow, it's the lineup. Uh, in the meanwhile, uh, send your comments to Box13 at GreatDetectives.net. Uh, follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives. And uh, be sure and rate us on iTunes. But uh, from Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, uh, signing off. <laughs> <laughs>